this really is an age of information overload, and I think it's important that we recognize and identify that, that we're being bombarded by enormously larger amounts of information than ever before. We take in five times as much information every day, on average, as we did in 1986. That's the equivalent of 175 newspapers read cover to cover. In 1976, the average grocery store had 9,000 unique items. Today, that same grocery store has 40,000 unique items. And because most of us get all of our shopping needs met in 150 items, You've got to ignore 38,500 items every time you go shopping. And that ignoring comes with some cognitive cost. It's because you know, you're not actually able to ignore something until you've paid attention to it long enough to know that you want to ignore it. We've created a world that has 300 exabytes of human-made information. That's 300 followed by 18 zeros. Just a few years ago, Google estimates there were only 30 exabytes of human-made information. We've created more information in the last couple of years than in all of human history before us. And we're assaulted by it every day. I think everybody feels that you're doing more, you have less free time to do what you want to do. Your head is always partly somewhere else. And I think that's no way to live. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. And I think we need to take some steps to grab back that sense of gratification that you get from being immersed in one thing uh, and, and not doing something else. What we're doing is multitasking, of course. And it's only in the last five years that neuroscientists have discovered that multitasking doesn't really exist. The brain simply doesn't work that way. What's actually happening is your brain is rapidly shifting its focus from one thing to the next. And because the neural switch operates so quickly, you don't really notice that you're shifting and it gives you the illusion of doing a bunch of things at once. We're shifting so rapidly that we feel as though everything is fluid uh, when in fact it's not. We're fractionating our attention into little itty bits. And all of that switching comes at a cost. And I know something about this because it was my laboratory that discovered the location of the switch, the neural switch that pushes you between activities. It's uh, in a structure called the insula. Uh, if you put your hand at the top of your head, those of you who don't remember your introductory neuroanatomy, uh, put your hand on the top of your head, it's a couple of inches below the center there, and the insula is what's doing all the switching. The problem is, as you might imagine, when you get a neural switch to switch, it uses up resources, neural resources that are in limited supply. Every time you ask this switch to operate in the insula, you're using up the same neural resources that you would need to solve a problem uh, or to get the energy to stay focused on something, uh, to come up with a creative solution to something. Uh, same nutrients, same neural resources. You're using them to switch, 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 switch. What we find in workplace studies is that people who will actually focus on a task, unitasking as opposed to multitasking, uh, at the end of the day, they feel like they got less done. But by every objective measure, they've been more productive. Their work has been regarded by others, often their superiors, uh, as of higher quality and, and possessing greater creativity. The multitasker thinks they're being really good at it, but they're not. It's one of many neural illusions. So unitasking, uh, immersing yourself in activities uh, for uh, 40 minutes or an hour, not a bad thing. We do shift back and forth, uh, but we're shifting to another mode. There's a creative mode of the brain that was just discovered about 12 years ago by my colleague Marcus Rakel. We call it the daydreaming mode. This is the mode that you're, you're relaxed, you're not doing anything in particular, you might be staring out the window, you might be reading a book and your mind has started watering and your eyes have been following the words but your brain's somewhere else. This is a great creative mode of thought. And it's the natural state of the brain. Unless you use your willpower uh, to stay focused on a task and blinkered, your brain's going to get pulled into that mind-wandering mode. So the mind-wandering mode, so many of us fight against it because in this over-caffeinated age, we feel as though if we were to stop working for just five minutes, we'd fall irretrievably behind. And so we go pedal to the metal all day long until nighttime, right before bed. We're working, checking email, checking text every possible minute and we never give our brain a chance to enter its natural state, which is the mind-wandering mode. If you allow yourself to do that, you'll find it's tremendously restorative. This is the part of the brain that is engaged in problem solving. You've all had the experience 
I'm sure you were trying to figure out the solution to some problem. Uh, you can't figure it out, and so you, you give up. You drop it. And then later, while you're shopping and trying to ignore 39,500 items, the solution comes to you just like that from out of nowhere. And in most cases, what's happened just before the solution came to you is that you were in the mind-wandering mode. Your thoughts were just sort of meandering. And the reason the solution came to you is that the mind-wandering mode is making connections among things that you hadn't previously seen as connected, just like we do in the dream state. That's why we call it daydreaming. Getting into the mind-wandering mode helps to push a kind of neural reset button in the brain. It replenishes your focused state allows you to come back to work refreshed uh, with often new insight and, and the restoration of, of the neurochemicals that have been depleted by staying on task and by constant switching uh, task to task to task to task. As a kind of rule of thumb, daydreaming could be 15 minutes every two hours. And in workplace studies, people who take these 15-minute breaks, at the end of the day, they've gotten more done. They've more than compensated for the time they took off. Uh, they feel better. And these breaks uh, could be a nap, actually. Uh, for those of you who can take naps during the middle of the day, a 15-minute nap, not longer, because that'll release neurochemicals that can make you groggy for hours later. But 15 minutes, 20 max, can be the equivalent of an hour and a half sleep the night before, and can be the equivalent of an extra I uh, 10 points in IQ.